all too often, right, with our phones, if it's, if it's the last thing we check in at night and the first thing we check in at the mo- in the morning, that thing is setting its agenda. It's saying, well, these are the notifications. This is what you need to attend to in this order of importance. I'm, I'm actually encouraging us to say, no, no, we don't. We, we can actually, honest creativity says that, no, I have enough worth in and of myself that I can trust human intelligence, uh, human ingenuity, and human imagination. HI will always be stronger than the AI. It may not be as fast, but guess what? Fast may not be the greatest virtue. It may not be as efficient. Guess what? Who said efficiency is the best thing? Hello, and welcome to the Shifting Culture Podcast, in which we have conversations about the culture we create and the impact we can make. We long to see the body of Christ look like Jesus. I'm your host, Joshua Johnson. Go to shiftingculturepodcast.com to interact and donate. And don't forget to hit the follow button on your favorite podcast app to be notified when new episodes come out each week. And go leave a rating and review. It's easy, it only takes a second, and it helps us find new listeners to the show. Just go to the show page on the app that you're using right now and hit five stars. Thank you so much. You know what else would help us out? Share this podcast with your friends, your family, your network. Tell them how much you enjoy it and let them know that they should be listening as well. If you are new here, welcome. If you want to dig deeper, find us on social media at Shifting Culture Podcast, where I post video clips and quotes and interact with all of you. Previous guests on the show have included Elijah Davidson, Josh Larson, and Mandy Smith. You can go back, listen to those episodes, and more. But today's guest is Craig Detweiler. Craig Detweiler is a filmmaker and author and president of the cultural investment organization, the Wedgwood Circle, and dean of the College of Arts and Media at Grand Canyon University. He wrote screenplays for The Duke, The Comedic Road Trip, Extreme Days, and directed the award-winning documentary, Remand, narrated by Angela Bassett. His acclaimed books include I, Gods, How Technology Shapes Our Spiritual and Social Lives, Selfies, Searching for the Image of God in a Digital Age, Deep Focus, Film, and Theology in Dialogue, and his latest book, Honest Creativity in the Age of AI. Detweiler's cultural commentary has been featured on ABC's Nightline, CNN, Fox, NPR, and the New York Times. Variety honored Detweiler as their 2016 Mentor of the Year. Craig and I sit down and we have a great conversation around creativity, faith, and storytelling. We talk about how creativity reflects the nature of God and is a godly activity, the differences between humans and AI, and the importance of recognizing humanity. We talk about perceiving inspiration through the openness to God's spirit and finding quiet moments, the role of criticism and collaboration in the creative process, and embodied worship and improvisation as ways to fully engage creativity. How do you strike a balance between digital and physical experiences and value humanity over technology? Well, join us as we discover ways that human intelligence will always be better than artificial intelligence. Here's my conversation with Craig Detweiler. Craig, welcome to the podcast. Really excited to have you on. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, Joshua. Glad to be here. Yeah, I'm really excited to talk about creativity uh, and the difference between just receiving machine creativity for us and then creating our own things. Like what, what do we need to do as humans to continue to create, to be honest in our creativity? I want to start out with some of your story of who you are and why, why you're talking about creativity. Where has story and creativity started to play out in your own life? Well, I've always been a story lover, whether that meant reading books, you know, in elementary school, uh, checking out, you know, as many as I could check out from the library. Well, but then that moved into, uh, films and really starting to resonate with the characters that I was seeing on screen and identifying with somebody like Humphrey Bogart and saying, I want to be cool like Humphrey Bogart. Uh, and then, then that has gone into not only just writing my own books, my own movies, uh, but then for the past 20 some years, also trying to educate the next generation. And how do I inspire, you know, young ministers, young youth leaders, aspiring filmmakers, songwriters? How do we help everybody 
kind of connect with that God-given creative spark within them. So how do you see the the relation between faith and, and film, faith and cr- the arts, the creative works? Well, so obviously, since we're we're made in the image of God and God was the, in a sense, the first self imager. And so I, I believe that it's something like as seemingly um, simple as a selfie can be elevated that when we're making selfies, we're reflecting the, the beauty and wonder of our self imaging God. And so that call to storytelling and to extending our, our lives and our visions uh, is something that is when we're doing that, I think we are reflecting the very nature of God and it's not a secondary activity. It's actually, it's actually amongst the most godly activities we can engage in. Before we jump into, to some of this, the stuff between AI and, and create human creativity, I, w- I want to know, so let's, let's talk about what's the difference between art and Christian art. Is there a, because it seems to be like there is a, I don't know, Christian art for me, a lot of times is derivative of our God-given like creativity. It's not the, I don't know, it doesn't seem to be elevated. And so why is it that if we try to put a, a Christian hat on something, it seems a little little cheesy, but if we just use our God-given creativity, it actually elevates the the art. Uh, I would say it's because Christian is a noun describing a person. It is not an adjective. And it's used as a marketing term, right? But that's using it as an adjective. So I don't believe in Christian art. I believe that there are Christians who create art. And that act of uh, going into the depths of their soul and uh, connecting to their uh, higher source uh, may create something, uh, you know, redemptive and surprising and funny and raw and painful that hopefully reflects the truth about how the world works, what is good, what is beautiful, what is uh, worthy. But no, I, I only believe I only believe in people. Uh, who are Christians? That's the only, the only use of the word I know. I don't know that. Other, I don't know that other term. I don't use it. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> I, I think that's. I think it's helpful for for us and a lot of people. Like this is, we need to start to engage in our our full selves and in our full creativity. You know, we're coming off of a a time. You know, in 2023, there was the writer strike. There was the actor strike. There was. And the big conversation was around the use of AI and what is it going to be in the future? And for actors, are you going to be able to use my image and likeness to create a a character that is not me, but it is looks like me, it sounds like me, talks like me? What is the state of AI in the arts of the moment? And what are the fears substantiated? Where are we headed? I I uh, certainly stood in solidarity with all writers and actors in Hollywood as as a screenwriter myself. There are legitimate fears that if studios execs can find a cheaper way to generate stories, they undoubtedly will. And so it was right to strike, and it's right to be anxious. You know, graphic designers. I can see why they'd be worried. If something like Mid Journey can render something this quickly, and if you don't like it, it can render another version that quickly. Animators who have done things, you know, sort of frame by frame, or in in game design when we've been dealing with world building, and then how do you build concepts? All of those, I would say, those early level jobs or those early envisioning jobs, I think, are legitimately threatened by the speed with which uh, AI can scour the internet for all imaging that has gone on in entire human history and giving you something resembling what you have may have prompted. So I wrote the book, Honest Creativity, in response to that collective anxiety to try to maybe 
talk us a little bit down off the ledge and, and to have a little less fear and to say there have always been tools that have always potentially, you know, threatened certain jobs and trades, but we have also always adjusted and said, okay, well, this, what can I do with this new tool and how might I use it more effectively and responsibly to make my work even better and not to ever use the tools as a crutch, but as maybe an accelerator for my own uh, ideation and, and creation. As we're moving forward with AI, how do we utilize it in a way where we could use it as a tool and we don't just get a, a copy of the real thing? Yes. Well, as a, as a uh, person who generates original ideas and thinking, I'm very concerned. Of, you know, there's kind of the three C's right now. Uh, the, the question of, of copyright, um, question of, of credit, question of compensation. You know, how do I ensure that my ideas aren't stolen? Uh, how do I ensure that the work that I'm generating isn't stealing from others? It, it's, it was interesting. There's an early court case that determined AI cannot own a copyright. So you may be able to generate something, but if it was generated by AI, that company doesn't really own it and you don't really own what's generated because it's not made or owned by a person. And so in a sense, only a person can own an idea or own an image. That's, that's pretty interesting. So there's sort of the dignity of, uh, of, of humanity is being preserved and, and protected right now in the court of law. And how do we do the same thing even in our own congregations, right? How do we, how do we lift up the sanctity of life <laughs> when it comes to, to creativity and ownership of ideas? What is the difference between us as humans and machines? I just interviewed somebody who, who talked a lot about metaphors and difference between the metaphor of like, of trees, like you're a tree or you're, you know, you're a machine. There's a difference between humans and machines. And I think sometimes it's dangerous to think of us as machines, because if we think that we're competing with the, the AI and the computers, we like, we can't keep up. Right. So how are we different and why is it important for us to reclaim the differentness of humanity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's interesting how I would say the metaphors of in, of each age uh, affect our theology. You know, so maybe in the Enlightenment age, there was this notion of God as the clockmaker who has, you know, set set the world in motion. Now the clock is ticking. I think now we tend to think of ourselves as like information processors, and it's like, oh, that sermon today, that was a big download. Right, we start to take the language of the era and apply it to ourselves, rather than kind of reversing it the other way and 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 say, well, how are we different from that? Not how like a machine are we in our in our processing ability, but how different are we from a machine in our processing ability? I mean, as an example, if the machines are all about speed and efficiency then perhaps how do we lean into a spirituality or a creativity that is slow and inefficient? And that that becomes a, like a superpower is that we can contemplate things slowly over time. Uh, <laughs> is that we can, can deal with emotions that are very complex that might take months or even years to unpack. So a machine can give us a quick overview of the, what the five stages of grief are, but we're the only ones who actually walk through those stages. as We grieve for the loss of a parent or a, a spouse or, or even a, a child. And so even when we think of terms of like God's grief over the loss of his son or Jesus's agony in the garden, a machine's never experienced that, but we've experienced things like that that are comparable to that, that allow us to open up into new metaphorical possibilities of what these spiritual analogies might be. Machines can, can, can kind of mimic human history, but they can't actually filter it through their own lived emotional and embodied experience. 
have you seen any AI generated product and can you tell that there's less human life behind it? Well, I, it's interesting. I, I, I talk with educators a lot and I, I try to encourage them to use AI in their classrooms and let the students begin to compare and critique and analyze AI generated content versus human generated content. And as those things continue to merge and there becomes less and less of a gap, and it's going to get trickier. In, in fact, even if you take early generation computers, robotics, and the kinds of answers that robots would give versus the kind of answers that a chat GPT will spit out, it is getting more and more sophisticated and all the time, all the time. I don't think that necessarily makes it a bad thing. It, it challenges us to actually come up with new metaphors and to not just build upon the past. Uh, I think as a pastor, right, it's like we want to know the full depth of theological history and all the different kind of interpretive angles and lenses that were available on scripture. Well, now, given all that, that can be generated by AI in seconds, how do, how do we analyze that? How do we look closely at that and say, well, here's the best metaphor or what's the metaphor that hasn't actually been dealt with? And so it actually, I think when something else can aggregate so quickly, it actually forces us to say, how do I go deeper? And say something that hasn't been said and and invite the Holy Spirit into that iterative process and say, give me something more. What do I need to know, God, that hasn't been said or done already? So then let's go into that process. Let's go, get into the creative process and and listen to the Holy Spirit and trying to create something that maybe hasn't been said, something that could show us, you know, the depth of humanity in a new way that could reckon with our, our fears and our joy and all the incredible things that our creativity does for us, that we could know that we are human. This is the life that we, we live. How, how does that creativity process start in a way that is, is the, the human process? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> well, the, the honest creativity, the book is divided into three sections and the the first section really does focus on us as people. And I, I really do start with our fears. I do start with our highest aspirations and I do start with our limits. And so it's starting with all that, the mess of what we have, maybe how little that we feel like we have to bring to the process. And that, that abject fear of whether it's the blank page, right? Of like, I don't know what I'm going to write. Uh, as a pastor, your reward for, you know, a great Sunday is rats. I have to do it again next week. <laughs> right. So it's the terror of the blank page that, that hits us, you know, every Monday, maybe then is Monday. We, we like ignore it on Monday, but by Tuesday, it's like, I still need something for this next week. And I, I think that that neediness is actually a great starting point because it isn't it isn't in our giftedness that we start, but it's in our, the gap is probably what I would say. And, and that gap to me is what the spirit fills in, right? That there's an image in the book that one of my students at Grand Canyon University generated where there's, there's open hands, you know, where they're there. And that's, that's it. That is how I think we probably should start, you know, that sermon every time is, is what I would call honest reception. You know, how do I get in a space where I can honestly receive what God would have for me and what kind of perhaps quiet, what kind of different setting do I need to create for myself? How do I need to remove myself from the crowds? All those things that Jesus, right? We, we hear these examples of Jesus doing these things when, when the chaos interrupts him and the disciple says, I've got a question and I've got a need. And when there's a, and there's a problem over here, almost always he's in repose, he's in retreat. And that's in kind of an active retreat, right? This is a person who says, if I, if I can go grab 20 minutes right now, I think I'm going to do that because I know how much chaos is on the other side. And so it's in the, uh, to me, it's, it's in those quiet moments and, and it's making those quiet moments for ourselves. Maybe it's turning off the radio in the car. You know, it's not listening to a podcast while we run in search of ideas. It's saying, I don't have any ideas. I'm going to go for a run and hoping by the end of the run, I'm going to get an idea. Yeah. 
Well, I just want to say this, I think, is a very important conversation. We have uh, the first gift of the Holy Spirit in the Bible were the gift of artists and craftsmen to make the tabernacle, to make it beautiful and to give a a wandering people in the middle of an ugly desert a place of beauty that would capture the presence of God. And so that's what the art does for us. It actually creates beauty that that transcends our human experience at times, or it helps us reckon with our human experience. And so I think as as church leaders uh, and people out in the world as mission missionaries, mission leaders, they're they're going to have to grapple with how do we express something in a way that actually points to the living God in our day and age. And so this is, I think, is important for each one of us. It's not important just for um, you know the screenwriters or you know, the poets or you know those types of people, but it's actually, we're all actually creative. It's not just an information download. We're not computers. So, you know, we talked about, about that. So we have open hands with the Holy Spirit. We, we walk in, but, you know, I often think, I don't know how to start to convey what I, what I'm trying to convey. I'm at a loss for words. I'm at a loss for the, the right medium to to produce something so that people can interact with it how do we know how to start like where to go like how do we say all right here's the the first word on the page and i can and it can go <laughs> yes well i i think it's a process of both breathe and receive and 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 so that that word for breath of God, right? That's that's that Hebrew word ruach, and and that's that word that was, uh, you know, that's that spirit that was in Genesis one. It was the spirit at creation. It's that same ruach that is placed in those artisans in in Exodus. And so in that process of breathing and openness to receiving, then what I encourage in the book is perceiving. And I think that's that's where it's it's sort of like I'm I've slowed myself down enough that I'm open to what God has for me, and now how do I perceive? And that's where Jesus talks about eyes to see and ears to hear, and 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 that's that's being absolutely wide open to the range of information that's often in front of us. It's it's in our neighbors. It's it's. It's in nature, it's in the news headlines, but it's it's slowing down long enough to to perceive what's really happening, uh, to perceive what's really needed, to perceive the contemporary metaphor that's right in front of us. Um, that's that's what grace looks like today, you know. That's what you know it means to turn around and and repent. That's what metanoia looks like today. Ah, uh, yeah, I did hear that in the news the other day. And I knew it resonated with me, but I wasn't quite sure why. Right? But it's easy to miss it because of the, I'll say the uh, overstimulation, right? The fact that we have too many stories and too many uh, inputs coming at us. It's very hard to pick out like the one. And, and, and yet it's often only the one is the only is all we need, right? We need that one example. We need that one metaphor. We need that one theme that then starts to open. Everything else starts to open up around us, and and then we, and then we trust it too, right? Because it's coming from a deeper place. Yeah. So so we perceive the the one thing. I think that's really important because we often think there's so many things. We actually have to go after the one, and then we trust like this is the one, and we're going to go after it. I think a lot of people are really concerned about how people, pe- other people will perceive what is being created. What what is the role of, of that of the audience? Is the do we? I I know I I heard Rick Rubin recently say he he says the audience should be considered last. I don't know what you think, but what as you're creating something and creating art, where is the the audience are we catering to people or are we trying to 
produce something and perceive something and, and tell something in a way that is just true to what we have just perceived. Yes. Well, so we've we've kind of walked through a little bit of the, the of what I would outline in the book. We start with our self and our own needs, our own openness. Then that process is is getting open to receiving that inspiration that you know uh, what some might call the muse, right? Somebody like Rick Rubin might not define it particularly, but most artists would say, "I got this idea." They don't think it generated from within themselves. They received an idea they heard they saw an image they caught a glimpse they 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 have a vision uh, that third process is, is is what do we do with the byproduct of this and in some cases it does become a product and that product needs to reach a market uh needs to reach an audience um but even that again still starts with needs which just says i'm not quite sure what to do with what i've been given and I think even that humility from the pulpit is actually helpful for people. Like, I'm not exactly sure what this means for you. I feel like this is what God's got for me to give to you. Now let's start unpacking that together. How does this apply? How does this connect? What can you do with this thing that I've been given to give to you? Right? It's always been a, a bit of a divine handoff. I mean, from the first upper room, it was Jesus like, well, we're here on this day. We've got some bread. We've got some wine. I'm going to pass it out. And then I'm going to see what you do with it. And so it's always been, in a sense, a divine handoff. God's given me this life, this body, this blood. I'm now going to give you my body, my blood. And now I'm going to see how you hand off this, you know, this kind of sacred trust to someone else. One thing that I think artists struggle with is that fear of artist res re response, excuse me, of audience response. And I think obviously pastors deal with the same thing. You know, how will this message be received? Am I going to lose members? Am I going to create, you know, some dissonance in my congregation? Are people going to push back against me for what I've said or sung or communicated? I think we have to be honest about how we deal with criticism and our fear of legitimate criticism and our discomfort with people perhaps challenging things that are, are close and, and close to our heart. That's a very vulnerable place to be. I'm sharing my heart and you're receiving it as information. In the book, I do write a lot about being open and honest to criticism, editing, and redoing stuff, trying to make it better. The most quoted thing in the Bible is do not be afraid, do not give in to fear, you know, God is going to be with us. So how do we, how do we navigate our fears in that and be open to criticism and be open to editing and all of the other fears that we have? I, I think it's admitting that we actually probably do need additional perspective. I actually, in the book, you know, discuss uh, David's, you know, relationship to some of his friends and critics in his kingdom that he, you know, people who were close to him who challenged him, you know, and maybe we need a, a, a Nathan in our life, somebody who drives us crazy, but also tells us the truth when we're a little bit off. Uh, I think a lot of, a lot of pastors, churches, ministries, missionaries would have been saved by listening carefully to some of that criticism. And so when we're blind to that outside perspective, to that outside voice, that may well be the voice of God. That's when we get into trouble. So if we can't hear and receive criticism, then we're really open to problems. So sometimes that criticism will come from, from the outside after we've produced something, but sometimes it will happen within the, the process with collaborators and i think a lot of art is collaboration as well and so it's the same within the body of christ it is all about us as the body coming together and working together and i think you know even in in a lot of your work it, it seems like your work is all about figuring out how you can take one side and the other and bring them together right and so you're looking at how do we work together and have some sort of unity? How are we more alike than we are 
are different and you could translate from one one space to another. So what is that work of then collaboration within the arts and bringing people together and translating for each other? Yeah. I, I think it's how one plus one equals three. Yeah. You know, that it's right. I mean, that's, that's just, that's to me, that's divine math, right? It doesn't make sense in the, in the regular world, but if you think about it, there are those, say those gatherings, those moments when, you know, the music leader has some vision and some word, uh, some song that they've been given. And if that, you know, pastor is also kind of dialed in at that same moment and says, okay, I hear what, I hear this musical word we're, we're being given now. What is the, what's the preached word that goes with it, you know? And if you can do that during the week, if you can get on the same page and not just be like, well, I'm thinking this, well, I'm thinking this, well, that's fine. What happens when you combine the two? Now we've, now we've suddenly got this much more holistic thing that's actually going to operate in, in the listeners on a whole different level because they've now gotten the message one, two or three different ways. And it's, and it's only when that holistic vision comes together that something brand new, you know, takes off. I, I just came back from the Sundance film festival where we've been taking young aspiring, um, filmmakers from Christian colleges and universities for over 20 years. We've been taking filmmakers to this gathering and we've brought other leaders, pastoral leaders, ministry leaders, artistic leaders to that. And to conclude the week, it's like I was in the position to sort of say, well, here's some themes that we've discussed this week. But we also had a tap dancer, a holy tap dancer named Andrew Nimmer, who was with us. And I was like, okay, Andrew, what if I just list the themes, like stand way off off stage. You can't even see me. I'm listing the themes that we of the movies we've seen. I want you to tap dance. them. I want you to dance them out. And, and so I grouped him broadly in like four different subjects. So there was time for him to kind of explore what that subject dance is like. And it just gave people a completely different way of processing something intellectual, but seeing it, but seeing it extended through a body, you know, what does this look like with my feet? What does this look like with my arms and my legs and my, and my hands? And so it's, it was a more full bodied response to some things that were, that were felt as well as, as, as understood. As Westerners, we often are in our heads way too much. Uh, and we just think of what is this right information? Um, and if we get the right information, we know the right way to go. But sometimes we need a more embodied experience. We need to know that, you know, God is, is with us. Like I can, I could sense that in a, in a dance and with music, with, you know, full, full orchestra, there's no, the only information that I have is, is notes and, you know, movement, but I do feel the, the, the grace and the truth that comes through those things. How do we move from the head to the heart to get a full embodied experience? I think that's the beauty of uh, that's something machines are going to struggle to do. The robots are are, are not going to be great at improv, <laughs> and so and so a uh, leaning into the body, leaning into in a sense live performance, leaning into improv. I think is just going to be a beautiful thing. There's a discussion in the in the in the honest creativity about what happens when um, jazz musicians improvise. And they actually have to cut off, they've, they've done analyses of their brain. They actually have to cut off like the critical portion of their brain that self-critiques and self-analyzes. They actually stop self-critiquing and then they cross over into this other side that says, I'm just doing this. I'm not deciding whether it's good or bad. I'm just doing it. And, and so it's a completely lived in the moment. I can't do it again because I'm not even sure what it is I'm doing. Well, that's a complete act of faith, right? Every time it's just like, okay, well, I know what the met- melody is. I know what the structure is. I'm not sure now where I'm going to go. I'm not sure how long it's going to last. I don't even know where it's going to end. 
And yet that's where somebody like John Coltrane, you know, doing something like a love Supreme or, uh, I, I talk about his solo in a, in a, a song called my favorite things from sound of music, a song everybody knows, but nobody's ever heard a nine minute improvised soprano saxophone version of what my favorite things are. So what does it feel like to express my favorite things? I don't know, maybe something like this. And then he just goes, right? And so that, you talk about being into the breath of God, into the freedom and the Ruach of God. That's an embodied experience where we're literally trying to leave our limitations behind and making room for, I would say, sonic exploration, but also spiritual exploration. So what does that look like to improvise in our daily lives? Like, how do we, how do we do that? How are we jazz artists in our daily lives? Well, I would say in a sense that, you know, uh, there's a theologian named Hans Urs von Balthasar who talked about, you know, our lived uh, life as a, as a bit of a play where God has given us, he set the stage, right? The, the creator God has set the stage. Jesus, in a sense, has given us a script. Here are, here are ways to respond with love in a variety of settings. But then, every day, it's a new, slightly new setting and a new set of characters. And I'm not quite sure how to apply those things. And that script that I may have even memorized now becomes an act of improv. And that's where the spirit en enters and says, okay, you haven't been here before with these people, with this set of ethical conundrums. What are you going to do? How are you going to play this scene? Every day is a daily improv rooted in confidence that the spirit has got us prepared for that moment. But we can still have fear. We can still have uncertainty. In fact, we should have a healthy fear of the unknown. But we should also walk with confidence that God has prepared us. Jesus has shown us and then the Holy Spirit will guide us in that moment. So as you're been working with a lot of up and coming people trying to study filmmaking and the arts and, and walking with people. When you're looking at the young generation that has, has to deal with these AI issues all the time now, and they're dealing with, with machines and machine learning constantly. What, what is exciting to you about this generation that, and how are you, how's their thinking helping us move forward in a, in a healthy way? I think they always figure out their own, uh, self correctives. So when Instagram was sort of saying like, okay, you need to put yourself out there and be Insta perfect. Something like Snapchat came along and said, you know what, what if the images don't last forever? What if you can just throw something out there and then it disappears in 24 hours? Oh, that's, that's much less pressure. Yeah, I can do that. Uh, and then you had another thing come along and just say, be real. I'm going to pick the random moment when you need to be real and throw it out there. And then that'll also disappear. So in a sense, all of the pressure that maybe the platforms have placed on people to be idealized or to be perfected or airbrushed. I, I keep finding young people who are saying, eh, I don't really want to do that. That doesn't sound like fun. Uh, why, why, why would I want to do that? And, and so at this point, my own 20 somethings in my own family, they would say, dad, you're way more on social media than we are. We're not as connected to our phones. And in fact, my daughter is like 25 has shut off her Instagram because she was tired of looking at it and feeling that Insta pressure. And, and so I'm like, well, if the 25 year old can live without Insta, maybe I can too, you know? <laughs> and so it's, it's like, it's an interesting thing where we like hand them the phone and say like, good luck kids. But then after maybe 10 years of dealing with it, they're like, this is dumb. I don't want to play that game anymore. Um, and so you now see kids who are more interested in, um, you know, what do you, what do you call it? Like folk core, you know, or they're, they're, you know, they're interested in like making stuff like. I'm going to go do pottery. I'm going to learn how to do glass blowing. Like they're interested in how do I manipulate the physical world because they've only been given a digital world. 
Um, they were more interested in LPs that we threw away. My kids are like repurchasing my albums from, you know, the used record store that I sold 20 years ago that have been waiting for them to come take it back. So there's always, I think we're in this beautiful moment of people wanting physical experiences and wanting lived experiences in a world that's only given them often digital simulacra instead. What is the space that we're moving into? If the the young generation are saying, we want to move more into the physical world and manipulate the physical world, you have technical achievements and advances that were unfathomable even 20 years ago. What, where are we moving towards? <laughs> What's it going to look like? Well, I'm, I'm fascinated in a world where like digital companions become like the, the preferred option that people are going to give you like, Oh, look, you'll have your own AI, you know, friend that you can talk to all day. Like in the movie, or you're her. all in love with it. Like, the movie her. In, like in the movie, her <laughs> exactly. I, I think the more you see that it's interesting how the Christian community could potentially be the last place where you could gather in person, you could get a hug. You could get a cup of soup um, and you could be handed bread and wine face to face, eye to eye. Uh, we could be one of the last groups of people who actually believe in the power of embodied experience because we, you know, have an incarnated God. So we believe in the incarnation at a time when the entire world is going for simulation. That's very interesting. And, and even just the idea that, no, no, actually, we actually take the the communion, you know, in the Anglican tradition that I'm part of, we actually take the communion to those who are shut in. That's how every service ends, is with the sending out of the bread and the wine. We're not going to let people stay home and alone. We're actually going to go knock on their door. We're going to bring Jesus to them. That's actually what we do after church. So if that's countercultural, then so be it. Let's go. Let's go. That's That sounds fun to me. I, I'm not opposed to the bigger, louder, faster church service. Like if you want to bring all the digital bells and whistles, that's fine. And if you want an AI counselor on your website to answer questions 24-7, I get it. That's, that's all good too. But do not think that that replaces the idea of the physical experience of healing touch, holding someone's hand and actually sharing a meal with others. Now I have some, some friends that are doing uh, church in the metaverse, like they're, you know, meeting with people with their digital avatars. And so it's a, a meeting space where some people don't have that face to face time, or they wouldn't want to have that face to face time for some reason. So it's serving some sort of a purpose, but I, I like the, the call for us to have a, an embodied human experience moving forward and it may be the place where we can we can do that for one another is is the church and that community uh, i hope so how what is your hope for honest creativity what do you want people to to get out of it and to apply to their lives i i guess i would want people to not fear for the future to not fear that the machines are taking over that we are now uh, forced to serve somebody else's digital agenda. All too often, right, with our phones, if it's, if it's the last thing we check in at night and the first thing we check in at the in the morning, that thing is setting its agenda. It's saying, well, these are the notifications. This is what you need to attend to in this order of importance. I'm, I'm actually encouraging us to say, no, no, we don't. We, we can actually, honest creativity says that no, I have enough worth in and of myself that I can trust human intelligence, uh, human ingenuity, and human imagination. HI will always be stronger than the AI. It may not be as fast, but guess what? Fast may not be the greatest virtue. It may not be as efficient. Guess what? Who said efficiency is the best thing? Did Jesus choose the most efficient way? It seemed like he was always going like the long way or the wrong way. <laughs> He was always like slow and inefficient in his ministry. So for us to want to be like faster and more efficient, I'm like, oh, I don't know. Don't know. Not sure that's actually how the gospel spread. 
That's good. We, I mean, we talk a lot in our ministry, the difference between efficiency and effectiveness. That's going slow and reaching through within our discipleship or, you know, human interactions actually is more effective in the long run than the efficient, even just like getting up and sharing a message in front of 15,000 people. It's very efficient, but the effectiveness long term isn't going to be there unless, you know, you have the, your your small groups, you have your one-on-ones that you're walking with people for the long haul. So that's good. HI is always going to be better than AI. That's true. Craig, if you could go back to your 21-year-old self, what advice would you give? I would s- probably say, I don't know, slow down isn't, that's maybe too strong because it's good, it's good to have youthful enthusiasm. I would simply say, you don't need to hurry. You don't need to hurry. There's plenty of time for whatever that that thing is that you feel like you need to get to. Um, it, it, will, it may come to you faster than you pursuing it. So, yeah. It's, so it's okay, young man. Just slow down. Relax. <laughs> There's plenty of time. Mm, that's good. Usually when we, we hurry, we make a lot more mistakes. You could be quick. You could go fast without hurrying. So that's really good advice to to not hurry. I don't think any of us need to hurry more. We can get going. Anything you've been reading or watching lately you could recommend? Well, a lot of the things I like, you know, they're hard. They're hard things to watch. You think about the the shows that won the Emmys this year. Uh, they were series like Beef and The Bear that start with a lot of anger, a lot of profane ranting at each other, which I think is actually a fair reflection of our cultural moment. It's, it is a lot of reactive anger all day on almost every channel. But both of those shows, the longer you stick with them, the more you start to empathize with the people and you see the pain behind the anger and you see the possibility of healing within it. But you have to put in like three or four hours of of dealing with the pain before you're kind of like, I don't know if I like these people. And then suddenly there's a glimmer of humanity and you go, oh, wait, okay. Maybe they're not so different than I am. Oh, maybe I actually am a little bit like they are. And and then suddenly that empathy starts to transform into something else in terms of solidarity and understanding. And then you suddenly, you know, there's some grace notes within both of those shows where, you know, you have people breaking down in church, listening to Amazing Grace, and you have and people that's discovering. That scene so powerful. Man. Right? And then you have, you know, moments of, of what kind of these chefs realize that they're capable of. And I'm not just churning out the, the daily beef, you know, but on the bear, I'm actually creating true art, artisanship rooted in hospitality. And so as metaphors for how we need to love and care for people and even how we set the table for people in our, in our sacred settings. Uh, I found both of them deeply inspiring. Yeah. Yeah. Those are great, great recommendations. I, I highly recommend both of them. <laughs> they're really good. They are hard. You're right. They're hard watches to sit through, but there is that, that grace at the end, those notes that uh, of humanity and artistry at the end that really, really get to you. And, you know, because, man, if you look at the Bible, there's all sorts of that in there as well. There's those difficult human emotions that are are there. So sometimes as we, we need to be uncomfortable and to sit with the uncomfortable so it can move us into a a better spot. I want to know, you know, as you were just at Sundance, did you see anything there that you're really excited to get distribution to come out? There were several films uh, that were just devastatingly beautiful. There's a documentary called Daughters that will show up on uh, Netflix later this year that the log line alone will sort of tell you 
uh, a little bit about it. It is uh, what happens at a daddy daughter dance in a prison. You have incarcerated fathers. What happens when their daughters come to visit them? And you, I mean, you can just imagine the swirl of of emotions, right? I I have not wept at a, a documentary ever in my life. Uh, both the moments of disappointment and and pain, and also the the the, the healing and the 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 joy of reunion. Uh, it's just super powerful. So that's called Daughters, and that's coming out. We out sometimes in 2024. And then there's another one called Ebelin, which I think uh, pertains a bit to what we're talking about with honest creativity. It's about a um, a gamer uh, who uh, was also severely handicapped and couldn't oh, yeah. interact in his body in physical life, but he was able to have it. a, a yeah. very active online life. And, um, and so it's about his parents essentially discovering his robust interpersonal relationships online. And so it, in, in many ways, it dignifies the, that, that metaverse ministry that some of those folks you're talking about, um, have undoubtedly experienced it, it, it shows to those who are like, what do you mean you have friends online or that you've never met? What do you mean you, you know, have a crew you know, in world of Warcraft that are, you know, your best friends, that, that doesn't make any sense. Well, this film shows you how that can be the case and that those exchanges can be filled with real caring and support for each other. Even if you've never been face to face. And so that's, that's, uh, yeah, Evelyn has also been bought by, by Netflix. And so it'll, it'll be out sometime this year for everybody to see. Great. Well, Craig, how could people get out, get honest creativity? Um, and then where would you like to point people to? How could they connect with you? Um, yeah, honest creativity is definitely available wherever fine or, or less fine books are sold, whether that means Amazon or Barnes and Noble or, um, you know, di- directly from uh, the uh, church publishing group website, I think, that put it together. And, uh, yeah, I'm on Twitter and, and Instagram and all those places. My daughter said I spend too much time. Facebook is still, I've heard that, uh, meta exists somewhere. So there's still, I'm, st- I'm still on Facebook, you know, for all of the other grandparents to, to join, join me. <laughs> I haven't crossed over to TikTok yet. I just think it would just be too tragic. Uh, I need somebody like, uh, Martin Scorsese's daughter, you know, has, has shown him how to how to be cool on TikTok. I need I need my daughter to take me under under her wing, but I think she doesn't have enough patience with TikTok either. So, so don't look for me on TikTok unless you want to make a, a digital version of me, and then you can do whatever you want to to me uh, and through me, I guess. <laughs> well, Craig, thank you so much for this conversation as we walk through creativity and what does it look like to be open and receive from the Holy Spirit and then perceive what is going on in the world to pick that one thing that we want to focus on to start to to walk our creative selves out so that we could interact in the world and help others start to perceive what is going on to move to a space that is not just machine learning and generated, but a, a space where it is interacting with the world with one another and moving from a place of difficulty and hardship and to a place of, of joy and some grace uh, in the midst of our pain and our sorrows. Craig, this is great. This is a fantastic conversation. I'm really excited to go out and uh, be creative and start to pursue uh, what does it look like to build something in this world that is not just uh, a reflection of what I can find on chat GPT. So thank you, Craig. <laughs> Absolutely. This. Hey, Joshua, keep up the great work. Keep shifting culture. All right. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you for listening to the show today. If you're really enjoying the show, please don't forget to hit the follow button on your favorite podcast app. You could do it right now. Just hit that little plus. Um, And then I would love it if you would leave a rating 
and review on Apple Podcasts. So you could go right now to the show and leave a star rating uh, and review and let us know how you are enjoying the show. And find us on Facebook and Instagram. So if you want to connect, interact, uh, I post a lot of quotes and different things that you could actually interact with the episodes and let me know how you are enjoying the show. If you feel inclined to donate, uh, there is a support the show link in the show notes, um, and it would send you directly to a page where you could donate so that new episodes can be produced for your enjoyment. So thank you so much for listening, uh, and I hope you have an incredible week.